You're listening to Design Tomorrow. Your life is changing. Actually, you know what? Let's change that sentence. You are changing your life. You may not know it, or you may not think of life in that way, but it is true. Everything you're doing now, or not doing now, is a choice you are making to change your life, and that changes everything, doesn't it? Another way of putting it is this. Time is passing, and you are spending it. You may not know it, or you may not think of time in that way, but it is true. Everything you are doing or not doing is a choice you are making to spend time. Time, a finite resource. Suddenly, things feel terribly urgent, don't they? And that's okay. Just let that feeling, that urgency, pass. Yes, time is finite. But time is also pliable. You can shrink it, or you can stretch it. You get to decide how you experience it. Sometimes, by way of mindful magic, you can even make it stand still. Illusions, yes, but existentially, what does that matter? What matters is your experience. Urgency is just a shorthand for what it feels like when time seems to speed up and shrink and close in on you. So let that pass. You're regretting untold profligate hours spent doing something that just didn't seem as wasteful then as it does now. But do yourself a favor. Don't do the categorical bean counting. The if your life expectancy is 80 years, then you spent three of them on the toilet calculus that may look quite clever but is actually a bankrupt rendering of life that assumes somehow that no meaningful experience can be had in the years of it that you spend sleeping, eating, commuting, cleaning, or dressing, and that these expenditures leave you only 40-something years to truly live. Nonsense. An outrageous absurdity, really. Life is all of those things. You may choose to rob them, of their meaning, but if you do, you deny the fountain of truth which flows from the mundane. Now is not the time to regret past expenditures. Now is the time to spend just a little bit more, to stop, to clear your mind, and to breathe. So do that. I'll wait here. It is a wonder how doing nothing suddenly makes time feel as if it's in great supply. Naturally, with the turning over of the calendar has come many thoughts about time. It's a new year, a new chance to live differently. And I want to live differently. And after much thought, I've settled on two ways that I can express that. First, I want to use my time more wisely. I don't want to be caught in the same waste, regret, cleanse, repeat cycles this year that I have been in so many years before it. And second, I want to feel gratitude more, more than the sorts of feelings that, oh, I don't know, wasting time tends to produce. These things are connected, and of course by so many things, not least of which is that they aren't exactly concrete. So the question is, How am I going to get them done? I've got some pretty practical ideas about that, which I'll share in a moment. But first, I found some unexpected encouragement in the form of a brief essay by Paul Graham titled Life is Short. On wasted time, Graham doesn't mince words, something I've always appreciated about his writing, whether I agree with his conclusions or not. He writes this, quote, If you find yourself thinking that life is too short for something, You should try to eliminate it if you can. When I ask myself what I found life is too short for, the word that pops into my head is bullshit. I realize that answer is somewhat tautological, 
It's almost the definition of bullshit that it's the stuff that life is too short for. And yet, bullshit doesn't have a distinctive character. End quote. Graham goes on to parse the various forms of bullshit, noting that it's often either forced on you, which presents opportunities to choose and prioritize each according to one's values, or it seduces its way into your life. Of seductive bullshit, Graham writes this, quote, Things that lure you into wasting your time on them have to be really good at tricking you. One byproduct of technical progress is that things we like tend to become more addictive which means we will increasingly have to make a conscious effort to avoid addictions, to stand outside ourselves and ask, is this how I want to be spending my time? End quote. So much in life works this way, doesn't it? Something ostensibly harmless, if not outright good, can go the other way simply because it's fallen out of balance. There's that old anecdote about the boiling frog, If a frog is dropped in boiling water, it will immediately hop out. But if it's dropped in cool water and then slowly heated, it will remain there, content to be cooked. However dubious the science on that scenario, the metaphor is useful. Modern life is one big frog boil. We've cooked the frog on connectivity and information access. Blogs, Twitter, Facebook, TV, texting, you name it. All bloated, cooked frogs. Almost all media begins as a useful and enriching efficiency gain only to bottom out as the latest patsy for that which rots your brain. Of course, we know it's not that simple, but that's where the frog cooking metaphor kicks in. Any of it can be good, in good measure. But once we overdose, forensic judgment is just not very useful. We tend toward drastic cold turkey measures, hence the digital farewell that has established itself almost as a new literary form. We've all read someone's Facebook farewell or their final tweet. It's a cry for help. And of course, it's rarely final. The people with the loudest goodbyes are almost always sure to return, and thus begins a cycle wherein, contrary to the metaphor, we can't take the heat, so we hop out of the pot only to find ourselves in another one. So what do we do? Graham's answer is simple but elusive. We want to go solution shopping, and the internet has taught us to do that, hasn't it? Maybe there's an app for that or a listicle out there that will tell me the five steps to freedom. But freedom isn't something to be acquired. It must be chosen. It's already ours, yet we deny ourselves daily, in so many ways. Not by making poor choices, but by not making any choices at all. So Graham asks, is this how I want to be spending my time? No one can answer that for you, but you. Today, I want to share with you a few things I'm doing to help me be able to answer that question with a yes a little more often. None of this is meant to be prescriptive, but I've often found it helpful to hear how other people solve the problems I face, even if I don't end up doing the same things they do. I hope that's true for you. You're listening to Design Tomorrow. I'm Chris Butler. Stay tuned. Design Tomorrow is a podcast about design, technology, and being human, which, admittedly, is a lot to be about. But in all things, we hope to grow in our awareness that what we do and think today can create a better tomorrow. You can follow the show on Twitter, at Design Tomorrow. Just leave all the vowels out. That's at D-S-G-N-T-M-R-R-W. You can also visit the show's website at designtomorrow.co. And if you want to get in touch directly, you can email me at chris at designtomorrow.co. I'd love to hear from you. And now, let's get back to the show. Hey. 
Every year, I find myself making habit adjustments. I don't want to call them New Year's resolutions anymore. I just want to be more mindful about what I'm doing when I'm doing it and always be willing to question all of it. And here are seven tweaks I've made just over the last few years that have brought me the most control over my time and more importantly, how I experience it. Number one, I'm in my notebook first. From high school through the first five or six years after college, I always had a sketchbook going. It was the first place my thoughts and ideas went, but that began to taper off sometime around 2010 or so. And though I had sporadic returns to the practice, I just never returned to the habit it was before until I took a one-month sabbatical from work and committed to spending time each day with pen and paper. I slowly retrained myself to use pen and paper to think, to capture, to process, to organize, to imagine. Sometimes I'm writing in it, sometimes I'm drawing in it. But the main goal is that I'm in there first, before I open the text editor, before I unlock my phone. Something about this has slowed me down in a good way. Perhaps it's the unique type of mobility of the little notebook. It doesn't need to be plugged in anywhere. It requires a different posture to use. It engages my entire body differently. And probably most importantly, it comes with no distractions. No multitasking. No internet connection. It's a technology of focus. Number two, I've dumbed down my smartphone. Now, I commend to you Jake Knapp's essay on the subject called Six Years with a Distraction-Free iPhone. In it, he writes this, quote, When the iPhone first came out, it was shiny and beautiful and cool, and I flat out wanted one. But I needed a justification, so I convinced myself that I needed it for work. So I got an iPhone, and just like that, I signed myself up to check and respond to email wherever, whenever. No pay raise, no new job title, not even a request from my boss. For me, this was a 100% self-inflicted responsibility because I wanted a shiny object. End quote. The whole essay is great, but if you can only manage to read 80-ish words of something before your phone distracts you with something else, these are the 80-ish words for you. Also, they're a pretty good summation of societal decline. Okay, now back to Earth. I took Jake's advice, and I gutted my phone. My home screen has only four app icons on it. From right to left, they're the camera, Gmail, messages, and signal, which is another encrypted messaging app. A swipe away is a second screen with only four more app icons. My phone, maps, calendar, and Twitter. Another swipe, another screen where I have podcasts, Spotify, Sonos, and Audible. Finally, another swipe, and I have a final screen where I keep settings and a folder called everything else. I have no news apps, no stock apps, no games, and other than Twitter, no social media. My phone is always on vibrate, and there's a very, very short list of contacts that can make it buzz. And probably most importantly, Notifications are turned off for all apps. Now, I've been watching my screen time app, watching my screen time and the number of pickups per hour drop. I never would have thought that an app could help me use my phone less, but this one has by giving me the truth. The rest has been up to me. Number three, I keep a journal. I try to write an entry in my journal most days. The goal here isn't to write, really. I do a lot of writing. The goal is to commit to a structure for reflection that captures it for the future. Now, there are many ways to do this. Many formats and prompts and times of day are recommended. What's working for me right now is to keep it as simple as possible. No specific format, no specific prompt, but just a commitment to reflect each day upon what happened, what was accomplished, who was part of it, and probably most importantly, 
the many things for which I am grateful. Some of my entries are really dry, play-by-plays really, and repetitive at that, but I can already see patterns emerging that are interesting and profound. Journal entries are a way to slow down and reflect on the recent past, the day that is nearly over, and in reading over mine, I can see how fatigue or specific events can greatly alter the way I recount a day. But a journal entry is also an investment in the future. Every entry is a gift that you can give to your future self, like a message in a bottle that you toss into time. In reading back on mine, the patterns tend to rhythmically reaffirm the many blessings in my life. Every walked the dog, or cleaned the house, or cooked dinner, or busy day at work today reminds me of how grateful I am to have a dog, to have a home, to have food to eat, to have a job, to have people in my life whom I love and love me. Now, one practical tip I'd offer is this. Don't use an app. If you don't use paper and pen, that's fine. Just use a simple text editor and a place you can put your files that's easy to search and read later. But keep it to yourself. This really isn't content for the internet. Number four, I'm very careful about social media. This isn't going to be the part where I blame social media for everything. In fact, I'm not going to blame social media for anything. I'm generally a fan. I've enjoyed using them, especially Twitter, and I've learned things, made connections, and new friends that I never would have without them. The problem isn't the media. The problem is me. That being said, I do believe that social media platforms are intentionally designed to encourage users to spend more and more of their time there. And that's not good. It's the result of a larger macroeconomic problem that I just can't make the subject of this episode. But ultimately, I'm not being forced to participate in that. I'm choosing to. If I've wasted my time using social media, it's because I've chosen to do that by not being more intentional about how I use it. That can easily stop as long as I'm willing to set and follow some simple rules. First, they're not open by default. I don't keep Twitter open in a tab of my browser all day long, and as I mentioned before, I've buried the Twitter icon on my phone a couple of screens deep. Second, all social media are not created equal. I'm choosy about which I use. I don't use Facebook. I don't use Snapchat. You should give some thought to which apps are a good use of your time and attention. Third, I regularly change who I follow and how I arrange those followers. Lists have been essential to helping me immerse myself in conversations and points of view that I otherwise probably wouldn't. And isn't that what social media is supposed to be all about? Number five, I've turned off the taps. This one is really simple. I have overdosed on information more than once. A few weeks ago, I was receiving almost 30 email newsletters, most of which weren't arriving daily, but most of which were arriving at least weekly. Worse, many of them were basically just paragraphs of links to other things that I could read. Now, I don't know what I was thinking when I subscribed to all of these. So, I dug myself out. I unsubscribed to most of them one by one, and I've kept only 11. Number six, I have bedroom tech rules. Now, I'll make this one quick. My wife and I don't have a TV in our bedroom. That's an easy one. As for me, I keep my phone charger on my bureau, which is across the room from the bed, not next to my head or within reach. If I want to read at night, I read on my Kindle. This keeps me insulated from bringing my distractions to bed. Number seven, I keep a bylog. So this one has been a really interesting experiment. It's less about time as it is about gratitude, but it's also been a practical move because I'm pretty motivated to keep my possessions to a minimum. So when I buy something, I want it to be the one that will last as long as possible. For instance, I wear the same boots every day, aside from the sneakers I wear to the gym and to run. So those boots have got to hold up and be comfortable and look good. 
But no matter how much research you do, any purchase is a bit of a risk. So what I've been doing for the last few years is adding a yearly recurring event to my calendar every time I purchase something that I hope will last. Not every purchase, not food, not drinks, travel, or that kind of thing. And thanks to being able to search my email for purchase receipts, I was able to backfill as many of them as I could remember. For example, right about now is when I bought my car, an incredibly boring, incredibly practical, incredibly reliable Honda Fit. It's six years old, and seeing that calendar event pop up reminds me of the six years of reliable transportation I've been privileged to have. And it allows me to do a rough calculation that only gets better every year, where I divide the 15,000 I spent on that car by six, realize it's about $2,500 a year, which amounts to about $7 a day. When I do that, the value of this car seems amazing. Especially since I haven't had to sink any more money into it other than regular oil changes. The point is, this practice reminds me regularly of choices I have made that have really paid off. And it reminds me of the ones that haven't. Regular reminders of both make me a more discerning consumer, and that saves me time. Finally, number eight, I schedule focus time. So far, most of these have been little, mostly personal adjustments meant to steer me toward better uses of my time and more gratitude throughout my life. They've helped me to have more focus at home and at work, but I've still needed to make other changes, especially at work, The thing about working on a team is that your time isn't entirely yours. Other people need it, and if you don't protect it, they're eventually going to have more control over your time than you do. I receive far more invitations to meetings than I send out myself. And while much of what I do requires attending those meetings and engaging with others, there are things I need to do which require focus and uninterrupted time. If I don't claim that time first, I won't ever. So I have two blocks of focus time on my calendar, Tuesday and Thursday mornings until lunchtime. Everyone on my team can see them and schedule around them. This was not my idea. I got the idea for built-in focus time from Cal Newport and his book Deep Work, which is basically about how essential focus is to doing good work and yet how focus is in opposition to our contemporary culture of work, which is more and more built around multitasking. Right? Shallow, unfocused, distracted work. Locking in focus time twice a week, just four hours a day, has enabled me to devote eight hours every single week toward projects that I probably never would have been able to advance had I not done that proactively. And those little investments every week have enabled me to accomplish so much more this year than I had the previous one. So none of these eight things I've done is the ultimate solution to the difficulty of managing my time. They're all just pieces of the puzzle. But I do hope that in sharing them with you, they'll give you some encouragement to either try them out yourself or better yet, to redesign aspects of your life in a way that will help you to get your time back. And that, friends, is it for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Design Tomorrow. If you did, find the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and give it a rating and a review. This show's future is grounded in a stark but subjective reality whether you like it and whether other people agree with you. So help me create that reality. Tell a friend that, yes, there's yet another podcast out there about design, technology, and being human, but this one is a little different, and maybe it will describe the reality you're living. You can email me any feedback you have at chris at designtomorrow.co, or you can tweet me at designtomorrow. That's at D-S-G-N-T-M-R-R-W. Thanks for listening. And remember, what we do and think today can create a better tomorrow. I'll see you then.